We are talking about God's wonderful word and uh, we're focusing on the little letter that Jesus' baby brother wrote, James. And when you read James, it reminds you of the Sermon on the Mount, actually. So I think he was listening to Jesus and observing him. And so when he writes his practical letter, boy, there's just pure wisdom. He understands about life and suffering and how to really get along. And, uh, you know, you might get knowledge from Google, but wisdom comes from the Lord and from his, from his word. So I want to answer the question, how do you filter your attitudes with God's wisdom? And there's two fabulous scriptures uh, from James. I want to read from James 1 and from James chapter 3. So just bear with me. We've got it up on the screen. James 1 says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. How's that, eh? Without finding fault. If you lack wisdom, ask God. He gives generously. He's not going to hold back. Without finding fault. He's not going to say, as Tim mentioned to you, he doesn't say, well, if your behaviour changes first, or if you haven't been a good Christian this week, then he's not going to give it to you. Hey, he doesn't find fault. He, he sees you in Christ. He sees you complete. And he sees all your imperfections and your struggles and, and endeavouring to become what we have the potential to be in Christ. And so uh, James says, hey, you, you, need, you, you lack wisdom in everyday life. You ask God, he'll give it to you. He's generous. He won't find fault with you. And it will be given to you. How emphatic is that when you ask? And he goes on to say, you've got to ask in faith, though. You've got to believe. And, uh, you know, faith just means trusting. So you've got to believe that God's good, that he's going to answer. And you've got to believe that he's great, that, that he'll come through for you. But you've got to be a little bit patient and wait for his good time. And so you can't talk to God and, and have a relationship with, that, with God without... Uh, uh, without the dimension of faith where you, you trust in his essential goodness you trust in his greatness you trust that uh, he is kind and that he will answer you and then how do you assess whether you are working and operating and living in wisdom you know some people say well I've, I've asked God and he's given me wisdom and then they behave in a certain way they think man that's very unchristian oh but God told me you know, I've received direction from the Lord. And meanwhile, there's dead bodies everywhere and, and people getting scattered and hurt. And so James, now at the end of, in, in chapter 3, says, well, okay, let's now define this wisdom. And, and I think this is a beautiful statement. He says this, who is wise and understanding, verses 13 to 18, among you? Let him show it by his good life. And by deeds, actions, not words, done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Hey, but if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Wow. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But this is the filter. But the wisdom that comes from heaven... You want to assess what it's like. It's first of all pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial, sincere. And peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So in this journey of life, folks, it doesn't take us long to realise that uh, people are not just funny, as uh, Art Linkletter would say. You know, remember that program, People Are Funny? Those of us who were born in the 1920s. People aren't just funny, people are so different. They can delight you, and they can also make your life extremely difficult. Tell them one or the other. They can inspire you, or they can really irritate you. And uh, most of our people problems are really personality conflicts. And, and when our relationships are bad, life is terrible. Isn't that right? You feel like dying, you like get into a hole. And, if your relationships are bad, it's awful, isn't it right? If, if it's not firing with your wife or with your husband, isn't it awful? And you've got to share the same bed? It's like, it's difficult. And uh, when, when there's pain, the people you love the most, 
And then there's conflict and difficulty or with your children or with your neighbors or at work or with your extended family. Um, you can have heaps of money and you can have heaps of things, but you will remain unhappy and be quite miserable if your relationships are not flowing well. Isn't that right? It's true. Um, now, the positive results of, of godly wisdom, uh, James says, peacemakers who sow in peace, that beautiful final verse, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. And he's really saying, hey, every day, guys, sow the right seed. It's as simple as that. The kind of seed that you are presently planting in your relationships and through your life will determine the kind of fruit you're going to reap. So if you're sowing seeds of anger, seeds of jealousy, you're going to reap a harvest. Or if you're sowing seeds of peace and patience, you're going to reap a harvest. It's a divine law of reciprocal return. What you sow, you reap. Seeds of insecurity, seeds of fear, or seeds of confidence, seeds of trust. What you sow into relationships, you surely will reap what you sow. Um, Look at verse 14 to 16, I love this. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast about it. Such wisdom does not come down from, from heaven. You might say, oh, I've received God's wisdom. He says here, you can actually, some people operate in a very unspiritual way and, and sometimes operate quite demonically. In other words, demons work through them, through hate and unforgiveness and bitterness and harsh words. So it's very rare that a person gets attacked by a demon a demon has to, an evil spirit has to work through a human being, sowing in a seed of suspicion or a seed of doubt or uh, somehow just angry and that person speaks and it's like the demon speaking and cursing the person, causing damage. James says here, be careful. He says, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, you open yourself up to the demonic and you're going to find disorder and every evil practice. So, so uh, where there's a lack of wisdom, godly wisdom, there's terrible problems, both human and there's a demonic dimension. Disharmony, chaos, confusion, and evil results. So the great challenge of godly wisdom says this in verse 13, but who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life. You can see godly wisdom flowing. And by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. So godly wisdom shows itself in our lifestyle. It has nothing to do with your intelligence. Everything to do with your relationships and your character. You can see it in your relationships and in your internal character. And godly wisdom creates humility. We all need to learn to relate wisely with people and Often we provoke in people the opposite behaviour that we're wanting and because we're unwise in the way we relate to them. Um, so we need to do a godly wisdom test, I reckon, to see how wise you are. You ready for a godly wisdom test? How many of you have done an IQ test, you know, the intelligent quota? How many you done IQ? Only one. I'm sure, Christine, you were about 150. <laughs> what was Einstein, 160? 70? So if you haven't done an intelligence test, they're horrible. Don't do it. It scares you. But it, it is actually illuminating. On, but I think an EQ test is more important, the emotional quota. How emotionally sound and stable you are. So you can have lots of brains. You can, you, you can have lots of brains but lack wisdom. See, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up, doesn't it? So I know people who are super smart, but they're so dumb when it comes to the way they relate to people. So you can have a high IQ, you can have a, a high EQ, good, but I reckon the best thing is your WQ, your wisdom quotient, test, because that will enhance your relating power. And James tells us here, if you want to pray to Jesus to help you in this journey of life, he will help you through his presence and power to build these things into you. If you're not a Christian and, uh, and you're struggling in life, well, you need Jesus Christ at the very centre. He will help you in this life. He will enable you. He will transform your heart. He'll make life beautiful for you. 
and uh, his presence and, and his power through the giving of the Holy Spirit. He died on a cross for your sins to reconcile you to, to God the Father. You can't have a relationship with God unless you come through Jesus and his cross and he died for you so that he can bring you to the Father. Your sins can be forgiven and cancelled out. You can have peace with God. You can have a sense of reconciliation. And then he gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit to gradually change you to become more like Jesus. And man, we need Jesus' wisdom. And that's what James is saying. He says, I've watched Jesus. And this is Jesus' wisdom, practical wisdom. And so if we're going to do a godly wisdom test, we need to be calling out to Jesus. And so this is the wisdom test. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. He is saying it's pure to start with. It's pure. It's cleansed from ulterior motives. When Jesus comes into your life, he starts cleansing your heart, which is full of all kinds of motives. And gradually sorts it out. With his presence in our lives, he enables us. It means being uncorrupted, becoming authentic. Literally, a person of integrity. It, it, so it doesn't compromise integrity. So Jesus will help you become a person of integrity, to become pure. If I'm a person of purity or of integrity, I will not lie to you. I will not cheat you, I will not swindle you, I won't manipulate you, I won't deceive you, I won't use you. But I'll endeavour to build my relationships around respect and trust. They're the things that really cause genuinely good relationships. Proverbs 10.9 says, the man of integrity walks securely. He's not afraid of being found out. She doesn't say one thing to one person and the exact opposite to somebody else. No one has a good enough memory to be a habitual liar. If you're committed to lying, you've got to have a fantastic memory to know what they say to that person. I said that, I said, what I said to that person. I said to that person. Hey, if, if you're a person of integrity, you don't have to have a good memory. You just, just speak the truth to that person and to that person and say, what did I say to you last week, Phil? It doesn't matter because I spoke the truth and I speak the truth to that person. You don't have to remember everything you say. Because you're always telling the truth. And if you exaggerate and if there's something that's not quite accurate, you just go back and say, Phil, you know that conversation we had? Because integrity is not perfection. It says, hey, I'm on a journey and, and this is the filter. This is how do I get godly wisdom? Say, Jesus, help me to be a person of integrity, the person of my word. And you correct yourself if you cross a line. Be pure. Secondly, be peace loving. <laughs> Wise people don't go looking for fights. They work at maintaining harmony. So they don't antagonise people's anger. Too much anger in our world. Too many people getting antagonised and getting upset over almost anything and everything. <laughs> Proverbs 23 says, It is to a man's honour to avoid strife, but every fool is quick to quarrel. Again, Solomon says, Whoever is patient in Chapter 14, verse 29, has great understanding, but one who is quick-tempered displays folly. None of you here have an anger problem, do you? You're so peace-loving. You're pure-hearted and, and peace-loving. Your integrity is intact and your anger's in total control. Yeah? Ian Hunter, yeah, you, you, you are. I mean, I, I've never seen him angry in my life. Well, David Hersey, he says he's never had an argument with his wife, ever. And I said, David, you haven't lived yet if you haven't had a decent <laughs> argument with your wife. And the Greek way is have the argument, make sure you win it. <laughs> oh, I envy people like David at the end. Man, pure hearted, peace loving. Not me, I was wild. And even as a young pastor, I, I, I did some stupid things. So, I hate injustice. And, you know, where you see evil and people getting hurt. And, and you, you think you're Jesus to try and solve every problem. And uh, I remember uh, a man who was a swindler. I love that word, swindler. He's a swindler. Not just a crook. He's a swind... What did I say? Swindler. Anyway, he wheeled his way into someone's home and the, the, the family were here this morning at the 8.30 service and I said to her, I said, you remember that? She goes, yeah, I remember it. 
And then a beautiful lady, her husband's not a believer, and he ends up staying in their home. So when I just found out, in, and she just said, oh, I've got this man, and she told me the story how she's helping him. And the lights went off, ding, 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 that's the Holy Spirit, ding, 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 like danger, danger, danger. There was no rational, just, just what she said. I said, what's his name? So, and then I, I remember, I did a search on him. This is before Google. I rang up some contacts in Victoria because he actually said certain things that people he knew. I thought, oh, I'll just check that out. Check that out, all right. Big swindler. The cops are after him in Victoria. He'd come to South Australia, and we found out he'd been swindling some people here, and he particularly targeted Christian churches and honourable Christian people. So anyway, so I sprung him. <laughs> so I got him up in my office with the couple. And he's not a believer. This is the man, not a believer. And out comes Prophet Bill. Well, the guy just freaks out. And he jumps up. And he starts running out my office. Now, a wise pastor who's under control would have let him run out <laughs> and stayed with the couple in the, in the office and comforted them. No, but I followed him out, walking down the stairs, and I'm giving him what for? I'm saying, you know, I've already rung the cops on you. They're after you. And he's like running faster. I said, they're going to get you. And I said, you better get out of Adelaide quick. I said, because they're after you and they're going to they're gonna arrest you and they're going to charge you and they're gonna, they've got the evidence. There's evidence up there in my office. I said, don't you ever do that. I'm looking at, don't you ever do that again. And he actually looked at me. So I'm, this is, I don't recommend you do this. <laughs> so he's, he's, so as, as I'm giving it to him, he turns, he says to me, get out of my face. Get away from me before I drop you. And you know, Mild-mannered Pastor Bill Seth, mate, make my day. <laughs> the old boxing tricks will come in that I learn, and you'll be down before I will. Well, I can't believe it. Can you imagine if he had a lunge at me, and I went, dum, 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 and out he went, and then the police come and arrest me for assault and battery. And then there's another man, another man who used to beat his wife up. And I found out that when she was pregnant, he would kick her, kicked her where the baby was. And I was, got so angry, so upset. They went after him. It's called pastoral laying on of hands. <laughs> anyway, I don't know what I was doing. It's like with that guy. I guess the sense of evil, the sense of injustice, and you want to do something, and you realize Jesus took the sword out of our hand, and he said, the state, Caesar will do that in this world. And if Caesar doesn't do it properly, when I return, I'll wrap everything up, nothing's going to be hidden. And so that's why we have courts and police and, and, uh, and sentences and all that kind of stuff. And anyway, so I went after this guy and went to the club where he was, and he wasn't a Christian guy. And I wanted to shame him, to tell everyone, this club that he belonged to, that this man beats his wife and he kicks her while she's pregnant. You've got to kick him out of here. He's not worthy to be part of you. That's what I was going to do. And imagine, and he was quite a big bloke, a little bit shorter than me, but uh, I didn't care. I was blinded to it. My anger wasn't peace-loving. What could have happened if he wanted to attack me? Again, imagine getting into a brawl, a fight. And afterwards... When I came, this all happened around the same time. I came to my senses and I thought, Bill, what the heck are you doing? You, 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 you hate injustice, you hate evil, but you, you've got to preach the gospel and you've got to provide the answer that is Jesus and then let the authorities handle these situations. You've got to take this, you know, so I let Jesus take the sword out of my hand and, and realize where it should be. And so I understand that you can get out of control, and uh, even as a Christian. And we're to be peace-loving. We're to be pure, to pursue integrity and not antagonize people's anger. And we need Jesus to calm the wild beast within us, the dark side, because we all have that. We all can cross it. And uh, if you think of the implications, if, if I did do the wrong thing and was charged... 
Man, that'd be great for Jesus' reputation. It'd be terrific for the church, wouldn't it? Have it? That kind of publicity. So, what causes arguments, folks, in, in your family? The two, two words, comparing and condemning. You are just like so-and-so. Why can't you be like him? Are you just like your mother? Are you just like your father? Are you just like that crazy uncle, that weird cousin? Or condemning, it's all your fault. You never, you should, you always just, you know, it is laying guilt upon people. And that just gets people angry. You can bury your marriage very easily by a whole pile of little digs. And I see sometimes marriages and I think, this marriage is dead. It's dead, just no one's actually told them it's dead, they need to bury it. Why? Because she's been digging, 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 digging. He's been digging, 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 digging the grave for that marriage. Having a go all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. Relentless. It doesn't work. What you sow, you reap. William James says, the secret of wisdom is knowing what to overlook. I like that. And I've often said, and I've, is, is you, to live in life and, and to actually get married and stay married, you've got to have one blind eye and one deaf ear. You got it. And the same as with, and, and with raising kids. You say, well, I didn't see that. I didn't hear that. Love covers a multitude of sins. So it's best to be blind and deaf to some things. In this broken down world that we live in, <laughs> of imperfections and sins, if you're going to be the sin hunter, the demon buster, and don't let Jesus be the person who does the changing, you just won't survive in relationships. And so to be a peace-loving person is what he says, look, this is the filter. If you, if, you, if you really want the wisdom of God, purity, integrity, pursuing peace. Thirdly, being considerate. Mindful of the feelings of other people. That's what it literally means in, in the Living Bible. Courteous. Considerate means gentleness, courteousness. Mindful of the feelings of other people. It doesn't minimize people's feelings. You know, a big mistake that, that we often make is because we don't feel the way the other person is feeling, then maybe we think their feelings are invalid or illogical or irrational or silly. Not so. I mean, this auditorium, you know, heating it is... I would say, man, it was really hot here today. Then my wife would go, no, it was freezing, it was cold. And then Milan would say, no, it's just right. They're all right, isn't that right? They're all right. But if we're convinced that we're right, we're actually denying a person's feelings. And you ask them for trouble. <laughs> so you can all be right. And uh, it's just a circumstance. Don't minimise people's feelings. I mean, it's a dumb little illustration, but I think it serves the purpose. Same thing, but different responses. Proverbs says, a gentle answer turns away wrath. A deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. So when we react negatively, we, we say things that can cause great, great hurt. Now, now, on Friday, I sent you all a letter, which you should have received by email if you're on our email list, a pastoral letter to all CRC congregations. In my role of leading the CRC uh, here in Australia, I've put together a letter. As soon as the High Court came down with this decision that the postal ballot is legal, um, then I thought, okay, out it goes. So this is being read in every, being sent to every CRC person in Australia and outlines my thinking and that of our denominational leadership about the whole issue of same-sex marriage. So uh, if you haven't read it, please read it. And there's a couple of accompanying articles. If you're not on email, we've got about 100 copies out on the information desk. You can take it and also use it to let people know. Now, you know my position and the position of the CRC. We've, we've put our statement down there. And I would encourage every person here to vote no. Please do it. Be great to see this thing king hit, say 60-40. Because of what they're saying, it's all 70. Uh, it'd be interesting to see. Wouldn't it be good? Now, my hunch is, even if it's lost, I I even if the no case wins it, the the lobby is so relentless that they've actually said they're not going to stop. They're not going to listen to the people. 
One of our major political parties already said that. We're just going to do it anyway. And we're going to bind every member that don't have to vote against their conscience. I mean, that's crazy. So an ideological kind of forcing social change. It'd be great if the majority of the Australian people could vote no. So I would encourage you, vote no. When it comes this week in the postal thing, don't just put it there in a whole pile of letters. Sign it straight away and go to the big red thing around the corner and stick it in there before you forget. Do it, please. And then ring your mum, ring your dad, ring your uncles. Talk to them about it. Say, guys, what are you voting? I'm voting no, and these are the reasons why. And argue the case. And I've tried to put down here reasons, and particularly spiritual reasons. There are a lot of practical reasons, and I haven't gone into it. Um, but I would encourage you, argue the case, talk to people, encourage them to vote no with you. You're a person of influence. However, we must do it, as we're preaching here today, to be considerate of the feelings of people. I have friends, my wife has friends, who are homosexuals. And they're dear friends. I have neighbours and people that I have a relationship with. And, and so we must be able to look them in the eye and to say, you know what? This is not personal regarding you. This is actually on a principle that we see. And that's why I think going the road of, uh, you know, the society says, like right now, uh, uh, people who are living together, two males, two families, they can adopt children. They can have children. And so the arguments for us to argue against that is crazy because I know some of those people are probably better parents than some heterosexual couples where he's just lazy and forsakes his wife. And, and so we can't argue on the case. That's the reality. There are children being brought up in same-sex relationships. And so they may be brought up with love and tenderness and in some heterosexual relationships, they'd be brought up with violence and ugliness. So we can't argue on that line. It's the principle. It's the principle that we're saying, hey, this is two, 3,000-year-old, a social construct. And this is the best and the healthiest way by which society can be. So we argue the case without being personal and hit the issue but don't hit the man. And, and, and I don't want to see any CRC pastor or church or any person becoming nasty. Um, so I've, I've talked to politicians and some who are, who are um, gay and, and, uh, and lesbian and talk with them and, and, and I would regard them as friends that we can argue the case and, and, and talk about the issue. That's why I've put down here, if you notice in my letter at the end, I've said this. I'd like us all to remember the importance of compassion and love for our neighbours in this debate. While we have strong biblical convictions, we must always respect the right of others to disagree with us and we need to model the radical kindness of Jesus to people we disagree with. This is the essence of civility. And let's remember that this is not just in our interpersonal relationships, but also from our pulpits and our social media platforms. Don't use social media to sprout fake news and misinformation from people who are rave artists who put stuff on on, on the media and people just uncritically, Christians put it on their thing. And say, That's just nonsense. Check it all out. In fact, if you're uncertain, ring one of the pastors and, and talk to somebody. So just be really careful. There's some really... Uh, I've said to people, I've said to CRC pastors across Australia, I think you need to take that off. That's not a wise thing to say. That's just unsound. That, that, where'd you get that information from? Don't do it because you're misrepresenting us. I wouldn't want anyone in the Christian Family Centre to put something on because then people say, oh, you belong to the Christian Family Centre. Oh, Bill Vasilakis believes as the pastors. This is what we believe, what we've put down in black and white. And I'm trying to guide the whole movement on that. And I pray that we win the case. But if we don't, let's say the majority of Australians, 60%, want to vote for it. You know what? We will live with it. The sky is not going to fall in. And uh, the church is not going to be defeated. There will be some practical problems that we have to adjust to. But uh, we'll move on in life. And uh, the majority of nations of the world are saying no. Don't believe the publicity. Most nations, all the Middle East, the whole of Africa except Southern Africa, are saying no. So it's mostly Western nations that have a Judeo-Christian framework where they're not actually adhering to really following the biblical precepts, which is really sad, incredibly so. So, folks, I, I say this to you. Grab it, read it, but just be very careful that we be civil in this thing and that we can argue the case without being 
And in fact, one of the things I, I do is uh, I try and test it with people who are homosexuals. Hey, what do you think of this statement? I try and get their endorsement to say, is there anything in there that is deliberately hurtful or insensitive to you? And I'm, I'm really pleased that I've had responses back of the message I did a couple of years ago, which I've got a summary of it out there, that people said, you know what, that's a good message. And that's a balanced message because we must be always realising our major mission is to present Jesus Christ to people and, and let, let him change their hearts. And then he will change people's behaviours in his good time and in his good way. And I argue the case there, but just in this message, um, you know, if we're going to be wise, man, we've got to be considerate, be pure, be peace-loving, be considerate. Hey, be submissive. Be submissive. In fact, before we do that, can we stand and pray over this thing? Let's stand together and pray. Let's pray over this matter. Let's pray for our nation. We love Australia and we're strong Christians. We're Bible believers and we love our country. There's just so many great things about it. I've just travelled overseas, come back from overseas. I think what a wonderful country we live in. And you know, if same-sex marriage becomes uh, the law, if they change the Marriage Act, I'm still going to love Australia and I'm going to work within the system and, uh, and we're part of the answer. And as Christians, we're going to present Jesus because the ultimate answer to our society is we need to have at least another five or six million people come to Christ. We need another 20,000 churches planted. Our country needs Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. And so I'm fired up to say, you know what? This is going to stir me to become more missional, more evangelistic, more focused. But let's pray that God's will be done. Right? Let's join with me now. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can... Stand and pray for our beautiful country of Australia. We love it and we thank you for all its peoples, Lord, from the first peoples, our beautiful indigenous people, to all the migrants that have come to make this a multi-ethnic united nation under the rule of law with parliamentary democracy and great liberal traditions that we have of freedom and standing up for injustice. And, and so, Lord, we thank you for this country and its wonderful history. And, Lord, for, for many of us, this issue has disturbed us and has troubled us. And I do pray, Lord, that you would help calm any emotional waters in our hearts about this if it goes the other way. And, Lord, we pray, we pray that uh, the no case would win. That's our heart. And yet, Lord, we acknowledge that we live in a country where the people make the decisions through their parliament and we submit to that. And so, Lord, give us grace and give us understanding and give us a heart to be able to accept if that's going to be the result. But, Father, in the meanwhile, the next four weeks, help us to be bold and courageous and to stand up and not to be intimidated by fear or to be classified as being homophobic or hateful because, Lord, we love all people because you love them and Jesus died for them. And so, Lord, help us to be bold with people and to share and to have discussions and to encourage people to vote the way that we want to vote. And, Lord, help us to do it with the spirit of love and grace and respectfulness and even with those who disagree with us, that we can look them in the eye and love them and accept them, that that's their right to make that decision if they, if they feel that way. So, Lord, we pray that you would be in this process, help the church to do it well, and uh, we pray for our wonderful country. May good come out of this, not evil, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. You may be seated. Hey, the sermon's not over. That's just a little interlude to stretch your legs. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So I've sent that letter plus two attachments that I've put together. And uh, so please read it. And you can take them. If we run out of them, we'll run off some more and, and make them available over the next few weeks with you. So be pure. Be peace-loving. Be considerate. Be submissive. Willing to listen, willing to be persuaded. It doesn't criticise people's suggestions. And, um, you know, a wise person will learn from everybody. She's not defensive and he's not stubborn. Wise people are willing to listen and learn, open to, to new suggestions that come. And you know, too many people just don't think. They just rearrange their prejudices. I think they're thinking, but they're not. Just like blindness, prejudice. Are you a reasonable person? Can your children reason with you? Can people reason with you? Proverbs 12, 15 says, A wise man listens to advice. Don't be like 
the person who says, don't confuse me with the facts, I've already made up my mind. When I want your opinion, I will give it to you. Or the poor pastor who starts his, his, goes into a new church and he does his first message. And old Joe comes up afterwards, you know, he's at the door. And old Joe comes up and says, you read that sermon. And in fact, you read it badly. You shouldn't have read it in the first place. And he moves on. And then Fred the encourager comes up. Oh, Pastor Bill, because don't listen to old Joe. He just repeats what, every, what he hears everyone else saying. <laughs> oh, be considerate, be submissive, and uh, just be ready to, to learn, to listen. And the day you stop learning is the day you start dying, really. Because if you don't keep learning, you stop growing. And while you're learning, you've got to unlearn some things. And uh, I've, I'm writing this book, uh, The Leader I Can Be. And I've made a statement in there saying, look, it, we, when the day comes when I stop learning, I'm getting off the horse and hanging up my spurs because you can't grow. So why be in a leadership role if you're not learning and growing? So in maturing and developing. So that means you've got to be submissive to other ideas and other people. So, so, so be, be submissive. So that's another filter to receive God's wisdom. The other filter is be merciful. You see, mercy doesn't focus on other people's mistakes. You know, do you just jump on people when they make a mistake? Or do you let people go? Or do you keep hounding them about their past mistakes? Um, that's terrible regarding marriages and, and with children who might be a little bit wayward or marriages that are difficult. You, you just can't keep talking about the past mistakes. Some of us never set people free even though they've repented before God and they've changed their ways. And we must set people free in our hearts. You know, I'd sooner have a marriage for two people. I'd sooner them be hysterical with each other than to be historical with each other. Really. I mean, deal with the present issue now. There might be fire, there might be noise, but don't be historical, rehearsing all the past sins and mistakes and, and stuff. That's crazy. That, that shows unforgiveness and bitterness, and it never works. You've got to deal with it. Proverbs 17, 9. Whoever would foster love covers over an offence. <laughs> but whoever reaps the matter, repeats the matter, separates close friends. Whew. So if you're wise, you don't rub it in. You rub it out. In Jesus, through his forgiveness. That's a filter. Be merciful. Treat others as you want to be treated. That's the golden rule. How would I want to be treated in that situation? Treat others the same way. And, and finally, be impartial and sincere. Um, it means without hypocrisy. Don't, don't live a life of pretension. And Paul's actually referring to the... Um, the Greek practice, the ancient Greeks were amazing. Do you realise they created drama? And, uh, and it hasn't improved much since. Seriously. <laughs> uh, historians will say they, they created comedy and they created tragedy. Now you think about movies, you think about drama, it's always all about a tragedy or about comedy. And so they were, this is part of them transmitting culture. So in every little town, you go throughout Greece, and it might be a town of a couple of thousand people that got a little stadium where a couple of hundred people would come in every week. Instead of watching TV, going to the, they'd go to the, the theatre. And there'd be hundreds of troops travelling the Aegean into towns, being paid to do their, their comedy. And they were smart. They were making political satire. And if you read some of the, the great, great tragedies of Sophocles and, and uh, um, Euripides, I mean, Shakespeare took his stuff, took Sophocles stuff and basically took developed tragedy. So, so Shakespeare's all taken from the Greeks, so he didn't come up with anything original, he just pinched it from Greece. <laughs> but you know, there was so, what would happen was, it's very expensive to have a troupe of actors. So what they developed was the whole thing of masks. So you'd have one actor who'd play five roles. So it might be, like there might be two people, but there's like 15 roles. 
So he's actually being a young man, he's got the mask on. And then he's going to be the young girl, takes the mask off, puts the other one on as he comes like this, the other mask comes on. And they're fantastic masks. Then an old person, he puts the mask on. And the people were caught up with it. It's like a scene, like a movie, cinematography, you know, like cutting. And, and it was all these masks that one person would wear. Paul's alluding to this here. And he says, be impartial and insincere. He goes, if you're really wise, James rather, not Paul, he, he says, don't wear masks. Don't pretend to be something you are not. Don't hide your weaknesses. It's dumb to pretend that you're perfect. If you think you're perfect, then this is not the church for you. If you see yourself as a sinner in need of God's free grace, this is the place for you. That's why I'm part of it. And that's why you're part of it. None of us have arrived. We're works in progress. And so, church, as we reflect on this, on the filter, if you want godly wisdom, this is how it's reflected in your behavior, it's reflected in your character. God's not going to give you something that's contrary to what he says in his word. And I think it would be great for us to conclude this morning by breaking bread and taking communion together. And to let the Lord sink this word deep in our hearts and that we apply it by asking for grace. Asking for grace.